We need Officer Singleton here. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, while you're getting your notepads ready, I'm going to ask you my questions. If there's, if any of you um, need to answer yes to the question, please raise your hand. During the lunch recess, did any of you have any discussions amongst yourselves or with anybody else about the case? No hands are being raised. Did any of you read or listen to any radio, television, or newspaper reports about the case? No hands are being raised. Did any of you use an electronic device to get on the internet to do independent research about the case, people, places, things, or terminology? No hands are being raised. And finally, did any of you read or listen to or read or create any emails, text messages, Twitters, tweets, blogs, or social networking pages about the case? No hands are being raised. Thank you very much. You may continue. Ms. Singleton, I believe we left off where you had um read the written statement that the defendant, Mr. Zerman, had prepared. Yes, I attempted that. to. Yes. After that, did um, investigator Serena show up and, and interview the defendant for about five or so minutes? I learned that later, but at the time I wasn't, I didn't know that. You didn't participate in that at all? Is that no. Okay. Um, we asked you about, or I asked you about the, um, that you observed some injuries on the defendant, and I want to show you, uh, with the court's permission, may we... Thank you, Your Honor. State's Exhibit 47, do you recall in terms of, you first stated when you first came in contact with him, he had a little bit of blood underneath his uh, nose, is that correct? Yes, underneath his nose, uh, coming out of one of the ears, I believe it was the, I believe it was the left ear. Okay. And in his, one of the sides, corners of his mouth. Okay. But he beard. was dressed in this attire, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes, he was wearing that. And um, in terms of possible injuries, did you observe that he had uh, abrasion or scratch or something uh, to his nose right here? Yes. Okay. And did you also observe some right here on the side of his nose and possibly some right here that I'm pointing to? Yes. Okay. And right here also, I'm sorry, State's Exhibit 66, the last one for the record was 64. State's Exhibit 68, is this what you were talking about, the back of his head, or the side of his head over here? Yes, there was more than one on the back of his head. And he had two on the back of his head, too, is that correct? I believe I could see it bleeding from two different areas. Okay. Um, Did you on uh, the 27th of February, the next day, end up coming to contact with him and were you present when a DNA sample was taken for, from the defendant? Yes, I was in the same room. Okay. For the purpose of the record, I'm now introducing formally the evidence stage exhibit number, I think you have a number for that yet. I think it's going to be Madam Clerk, Madam Clerk, Madam Clerk, Your Honor. Yes, ma'am. I believe it should be 207, is that the next number available? Yes, this is stipulated too. 207. Oh, I'm sorry.
There's a video uh, that shows the DNA uh, sample being taken using the swab. Is that correct? You were present for that? Yes, I was present when that was taken. Okay. Actually, Judge, it's 208, 207 was medical records and we're then on Friday. So it's 208? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Madam Clerk. May I publish that to the jury on? Yes, you may. Singleton, is this you over here standing over here? Yes, Mr. that's Singleton? me. And is this a technician that's taking the DNA sample from Mr. Zimmerman? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Recognize that as being the DNA sample or swab that was used to obtain a DNA sample from the defendant, Mr. Zimmerman. I wouldn't. Have, I wouldn't have packaged that. I mean, it could be the same one. I you were present have. when that was done. I was present when a DNA sample was taken from him. Okay. Thank you. Singleton, 
Did you want a? Going back to the day before, February 26, did you have a conversation with the defendant where he asked you something regarding a cross that you were wearing? Yes, Af yeah. after the interviews, I yes. was sitting there with him and we were just waiting for whatever it was. I don't even recall what it was. But I remember being in the room with him and I had a silver cross on and I had a V-neck shirt so you could, you could see the cross. It's just small, about a one inch silver cross and he asked me if I was Catholic. And do you want me to just tell the whole story? I yes, please. He, he asked me if I was Catholic, and I said no, and I asked him why he would ask me that. And he said because he had noticed the cross. Um, I said no, I'm, he's, I said no, I'm Christian. And I said, so you know, basically why does it matter? And he said because in his religion, in the Catholic religion, that it's no matter what, always wrong to kill somebody. And I said, well, as far as what you've said to me, if what you're saying is true, then I don't think that's what God meant. I don't think God meant you can't, you know, save your own life. Okay. Was that the extent of the conversation? That's regarding? basically the essence of the conversation. I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? I apologize. I'm not okay. sure all the jurors can hear that. He asked me if I was Catholic when I asked him why. He said he had noticed the cross. I said, no, I'm Christian. Why, do you, why does it matter? He said, because in Catholic religion, it's always wrong to kill somebody. I said, well, if what you're telling me how it happened is true, then I don't think that's what God meant. He didn't mean that you couldn't save your own life. Also, that's not on the recording. Did you also have a conversation with him when you were talking about the age of the victim at the time, that he was a um, certain age? Do you recall that? Yes, at some point uh, I had said that we weren't able to identify the victim. And he said, well, what do you mean you haven't been able to identify him? I said, well, we don't know who he is. And he said, he's dead? And I said, I thought you knew that. I thought you knew he was dead, and he, it's, he kind of slung his head and just shook it. The uh, 27th, we talked about the, the DNA sample that was taken from the defendant. Were you also present when a reenactment was done? And I'm going to ask Investigator Serino about that. Were you present for parts of that? Yes, I was pre present for that. Um, were you also present on February the 29th of 2012 at the Sanford Police Department when the defendant was interviewed by the t uh, investigator Serino? Yes. Okay. Were you present for parts of that also? Yes. Okay. In fact, were you involved in actually uh, reading the defendant's constitutional rights or Miranda rights? Probably so. Okay. May I'm going to show you what's been marked if I may approach the witness, Your Honor? Yes, you may. Stage Exhibit 177, introducing evidence without objection. Ask you if you recognize State Exhibit 177. Yes. And would those have been, um, I know it's a bigger form, but is that the same Miranda rights that you would have read to them uh, on the 26th? Yes, I'm not sure if they're ex identical word for word, but it's similar and they all. Okay, and that would have been on 229 at 515 p.m.? Yes. Okay. Did he agree to talk to you? Uh, you were specifically also Investigator Serino? Yes, he agreed to speak with us. Did you or Investigator Serino threaten him in any way in order to get him to make a statement on uh, February the 29th? No. Did we you or, do that. Did you or Investigator Serino make him any promises in order to get him to make a statement? No, we didn't promise him anything. I'm sorry, no. We did not promise him anything. And did he on February 29th appear to be under the influence of alcohol and or drugs to the point that he did not understand what was going on? I didn't see any indication of any influence. And uh, Investigator Serena is going to talk about the interview, but I just wanted to get that preliminary matter out of the way. If I may have a moment, Your Honor. Yes, please. I remember the question. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, officer. 
Good afternoon. How are you? I'm fine. Good. You testified um, briefly about your um, background in order to become a law enforcement officer. I just want to touch on that for a moment, okay? Yes. Um, I think you said that you had gotten a degree, correct? Yes. Um, and was that in criminal justice? Yes, from the University of Central Florida. It was a major in criminal justice with a minor in legal studies. Okay. And um, when did you first consider uh, law enforcement as a career? After I got out of the military. Okay. So you were in the military before you went to UCF? Yes. Okay. May I ask what service you were with? I was with the Army. And for how many years? Three. Did you do any type of work sort of with military police or anything that gave you the insight that you might want to be in law enforcement? No. But at some point then after the Army and before college, you made a decision that you might want to consider law enforcement? Yes. Why is that? I wanted to be able to help people, and there was issues in my family that I wanted to show that someone good could come from my family. Okay. Have you enjoyed it so far? Yes. Glad that you made that decision? Yes. Been able to help? I'm sorry? Have you been able to help like you wanted to? Not as much as I would like, but yes. Okay. Sometimes a bit frustrating, I would imagine. Yes. But overall, a good profession to be involved in? Yes. You've done that now, for, I guess, with SPD for just over nine years? Just shy of nine years. Just shy. And your involvement in this case was almost happenstance in that you were called in to help out, correct? Yes. Um, normally this may have just gone to whoever else. Had there been somebody else um, on duty already? Yes. But with back then, I guess, just shy or you know, seven and a half, eight years experience, they decided to bring you in in order to do the initial interview, correct? Yes, Sergeant Santiago decided that. Okay. And um, I presume that before February 26th, you certainly interviewed a number of witnesses before? Yes. And a number of suspects? Yes. Okay. How many of those suspects actually voluntarily give you information without asking for a lawyer? Most subjects will actually I'm speak sorry? with you. Most people will. And how about in those cases involving a shooting? I'm not sure about that. Okay. In this case, of course, Mrs. Zimmerman was what we call Mirandized, right? Given advice that he had the right not to talk to you at all, correct? Yes, he was given that. And um, as you testified in direct, you certainly did it in a proper way, and he evidenced that he understood it? Yes. And he freely waived it? Yes, he freely waived it. And you know, as law enforcement, even an initial waiver can be withdrawn by a um, suspect? Somebody yes, and that's at. explained to them during the Miranda sure. warning readings. And, and if at any time any person being interviewed decides to stop, they merely need to tell you that and then it's over, correct? Then it would end, yes. And only until they decide affirmatively to re-engage you or if you get permission from their lawyer, would you ever talk to them again? That's right. That never happened in this case, correct? No, he never refused to speak with us. Sure. He never refused to speak to you that night, either the first or second interview, sort of that break in between, right? He never refused any yeah. to speak to us anytime we asked. And you testify concerning Investigator Serino's interview with him where you Mirandized him again, and of course he acknowledged those rights then, did he not? Yes. And waived him again affirmatively? Yes. And never during that interview did he reassert any right to remain silent, did he? No, he never did. And you're familiar with the reenactment video where he actually went out to the scene and walked through um, what had happened, that, what turned out to be the night before, correct? Yes, I was there. Yeah, and of course, he, that was done voluntarily, correct? Yes, it was. That could not be forced upon him, could it? No, it could not be. And it wasn't in this case, was it? It wasn't. So every time that George Zimmerman spoke with you, uh, it was voluntary? Yes. And he was given full notice he had the right to stop at any point? Each time, yes. Let's then talk about the initial interview, and I want to sort of set the stage a little bit for the jury to understand what you knew, and maybe what George Zimmerman knew about what had gone on 
um, before the interview. So let me ask you, um, did you know anything about this case other than it was a shooting and you were talking to the person who had shot the other person? That's about as much as I knew. Yeah. So it's basically you were brought in, there was a lot going on at Retreat View, Twin Lakes, and they had to get him talked to away from the scene, and you were the person to do it, right? Yes. Okay. Now, um, we had heard one sort of interaction between you and law enforcement during the interview process, um, which is where I believe it was Santiago, Sergeant Santiago talk to you about looking into the videotaping question, correct? Yes. All right. Was there any other times during the initial interview with George Zimmerman where he was advised what information existed at the scene? No. He could not have. I didn't know. Okay. For example, you know, correct, now, that there was an eyewitness to a part of the event, correct? I knew after that interview, yes. No, I mean, today you know that, right? Today I know that. You know today that there was an eyewitness to a portion of the event, correct? Yes. You know today that there was a 911 call that has screams on it, correct? Yes. And of course you know today that there are a number of other ear witnesses that heard things and some of them saw other things at some point in this timeline of the shooting. You're aware of that now, right? Yes, and I spoke with most of them. Okay. From the questions and answers that Mr. Zimmerman gave you, did he evidence an awareness that he was aware that there was a 911 tape that had documenting at least somebody screaming that night? The only thing he indicated is the person on the patio that saw him. Yes. He saw he's, I'm sorry. said that he was going to call 911. That person told him that. But Mr. Zimmerman never evidenced to you that he knew that there would be a call that actually documented his screamings, did he? Objection. Call for facts that are not in evidence that he was the one screaming. I'll, re I'll rephrase it. Did, um, oh. As to that, then I'm sorry, I'll rephrase it. Did Mr. Zimmerman ever evidence to you that he knew there was a 911 call that would document somebody screaming for help? No. On the, during the interview, I suggested to him that possibly someone heard something uh, that was heard, overheard by 911, and he agreed that maybe it had. But he had told you even before that part of the conversation that it was he who was screaming for help, did he? Yes. Know? Yes. And um, you've become aware in this investigation that Officer Tim Smith. Objection is the hearsay. Let me hear the rest of the question. You. You've become aware during your involvement in the investigation that Officer Tim Smith was told by Mr. Zimmerman that he was screaming for help. Objection, Your Honor. Correct. Ask again, please. Sure. You became aware during your involvement with the investigation that Officer Tim Smith, the first officer on the scene, you, right, was mm -hmm. told by George Zimmerman within moments after Mr. Officer Smith's arrival that George Zimmerman was screaming for help. Yes, I've learned that. Okay. And that, of course, was well before any suggestion that you may have said to him that a 911 call may actually document screaming for help. I never suggested that to him, ever. He had also told you that during the altercation, and I'm going to use names, obviously you didn't know Trayvon Martin's name during the interview, correct? I did not know the victim's name. I'm going to use his name as I question you, if I might. As though you knew it then. Obviously, I know you realized okay. you found it later, but just so we can keep the names separate and um, identified, okay? Okay. When Mr. Zimmerman stated that Trayvon Martin was hitting his head on concrete, um, had you given Mr. Zimmerman any evidence of that, that 
a witness existed to document that? No, I wouldn't have. Just a second. Mr. O'Mara testified as to what somebody else said if this witness had no knowledge of it. Sustained. Um, I might rephrase it then, Your Honor. Did you have any information from any source that you related to Mr. Zimmerman that there was an eyewitness who had documented the smashing of the head on concrete? Same objection as to Mr. O'Mara testifying as to what somebody else possibly said, unless this witness told this defendant. Okay, there's a speaking objection, but you need to lay a foundation okay, yes, before you ask that question. You've become aware, of course, over the time of this investigation that there is an eyewitness who documented that Trayvon Martin was smashing George Zimmerman's head on concrete, correct? Yes, we may approach. Yes, you may. Thank you. Suffice it to say, officer, that um, there is nothing available from law enforcement, no information available from law enforcement that was given to Mr. Zimmerman before he gave his statement to you, correct? I didn't have any information that I could have even possibly given. And there were no other police reports that had already been generated that he may have seen or anything like that, correct? Nothing had been generated so far. Is it accurate then to say that this was in one sense the virgin interview where you were getting all the information from him that you could, though you had nothing even to corroborate or to dispute what he was telling you? That is correct. You had mentioned um, and I'm going to skip around just a little bit and hit okay. subjects rather than the timeline. I think the timeline was going through. And of course, the entirety of your true interaction with Mr. Zimmerman was on the tape, correct? There was small bits that were not? A little bit before I could get it started. Right. Introductions to, to each other when I yes. walked in the room, I'm sure. And something that may have been said as I walked out. But Sure. The substance of it we've all heard now from the tape itself. Yes. And as to that interview, you don't have a great deal of testimony that you can offer the jury except to listen to the tape, correct? Pretty much. Part. Okay. So why are we questioning you? Sorry. 
So then why then will we spend a few minutes questioning you? We're going to try and move it along, but obviously, as you know from previous testimony, I just want to make sure we set the stage properly and anything that may have some inquiry, and then we'll move forward. So okay. the, um, let's go to one of the parts that were talked to about um, by Mr. Delrionda concerning what wasn't on the tape. And, um, and that was the part about um, the, whether or not you were Catholic or Christian. Um, and I want to just spend a moment on that, if I might. Um, he had noticed your cross, I think he said? Yes. And asked you whether or not you were Catholic. Yes. And he told you that he was Catholic? I don't know that he said he was Catholic. He asked if I were Catholic, and I told gotcha. him that I wasn't. So I assumed okay. that he was Catholic. All right. And then he told him you were Christian, and his response was what again? Because in the Catholic religion, it is always wrong to kill somebody. And your response to that? Was that if what you're telling me is truthful, then I don't believe that that is what God means when he means to kill somebody. Is it your opinion that if what he was telling you is true, no. presuming that it was true, it was your suggestion then to comfort him in whatever he was working through? To let him know if he was being truthful that he was in fear for his life and he had to kill Trayvon, that I don't believe that was what God meant. Okay. And then I think it was just right after that that you had said that Trayvon Martin was not identified yet? We did not know who he, who he was. And that time. was, yes. And that was when you communicated that to George Zimmerman, correct? I don't know if it was directly at that same moment, but yes, he, we spoke about not being able to know who the victim was. Mm -hmm. Or I made a statement, I don't know what it was in response to, was that we hadn't yet identified the victim. And um, his response was that he didn't even realize that Trayvon Martin had passed, correct? He, he gave me yeah, like a blank stare on his face and said, you know, what, do you, what do you mean? You don't know the victim. I said, well, we don't know who he is. And he said, he's dead? And I, saw, I asked him, I mean, I said to him, I thought you knew that. At which point he just sort of sunk his head down looking down to the floor. Or well, towards the table. On the table and shook his head, no. Yeah, I mean, I could, I, something like this, and then, like he was just. What did that evidence to you? It, it, I believed him that he didn't realize he was dead based on what I had seen, but I don't, I don't want to speculate as to what it meant beyond that, I'm not sure. There was questions about, and it was on tape about him needing medical care. Uh, that was a concern of his, was it not, at least at one point? Yes, at one point he said he wasn't sure if he should go. Okay. But it was such that you talked about it and he was willing to continue with the interview rather than go to the hospital, correct? Yes. Did that cause you any concern? No, only because FD had already seen him and I assumed that they had said it was okay for him to come to the police department if he had. During the interview with you, and I know that you would defer to the tape, but since you were the one sort of three-dimensional there with him, did he evidence that he was angry with Trayvon Martin? No. That he had hatred for him? No. Spite or ill will? No. That he had anything that would suggest to you some type of bad attitude towards Trayvon Martin? No. Rather, he seemed to be affected by the fact that he realized that Trayvon Martin had passed? He seemed affected by that. You were, uh, aside for, from Officer Tim Smith, 
really the first officer to have a detailed conversation or any conversation with him about this case, right? Yes. And that was about, uh, you gave us the time, but tell us again if you can, if you recall the timing of it. I believe I was called about 8 o'clock. So pro about prior to 9 o'clock, maybe I was speaking to him. I so and if this happened at 7.15, 7.30, he was transported after being seen by medical, you got to him within an hour and a half of the event? I believe so. Do you know if he had contact with anybody else besides Sanford Police Department? I don't know. I only know what was told to me. And that was? Rescue, police. That was all I knew about. Of course, though not arrested, he was in police control or custody literally from the scene forward, was he not? Yes. And his phone was taken from him, correct? Yes. Mention was made that, first of all, you took the tape statement, correct? And we've heard that. And then you asked him to do a written statement. Why have both? I believe Chris Serino asked me to have him put it on a written statement. I believe Chris Serino had asked me to have him put it on a written statement as well. Okay. And with that microphone, it's very sensitive. If you get within about an inch or so, we can't hear. If you get more than five inches back, we can't hear you. <laughs> so there's a range in there that if you can try and stay within, it'll help the jury hear us and, and all of us. I'll try. Thank you. Okay. Um, you've had a chance to look at both of those statements, correct? Yes. And of course you heard yours today and you even, I'm sorry, you heard the tape today and you even had to read the second one today, correct? I don't recall reading, No, I mean having read the, the written one prior to today. But you just read it today? Yes. Okay. In nine years or so of law enforcement experience, did you notice any significant inconsistencies in those two statements? Significant? No. But there were certainly some, weren't there? I'm sure there's some. Is that expected in your business? Yes, most people don't tell you the same story the same way twice each time. Why is that? I don't know. I mean, just telling a story, you don't tend to get the exact details the same each and every time. Okay. So when you looked at those two statements, did you consider them to be significantly different, such that you thought he was lying on one or fudging on one? Well, I couldn't have made that determination then because I hadn't read the statement back then. I mean, right now? Right now? No. I don't see any significant differences. So in your experience, when taking multiple statements from a witness, sometimes there are differences? Yes. How about witnesses who have gone through traumatic events? Does that affect their ability to recount stories? Yes, as well as the same Why is event that? being viewed by two different people. It's sometimes different. Okay. And how does a traumatic event affect their ability to um, retell stories multiple times? I'm not sure how it works, but I just know that it happens. Okay. You were present during uh, Investigator Serino's um, statement as well. Well, the statement he gave to Officer Serino as well, correct? Yes. And did you notice significant differences in that statement compared to these two? Not significant, no. But some minor changes? Some minor differences, yes. And do you recall what they were? Um, I remember one where he had he told me that he walked away. And then in the interview when we listened to the tape, he was telling the dispatcher that he had ran away. Like, uh. he was running. And when the he, you're talking about, at one point he told you, he being... George, George Zimmerman told you that Trayvon Martin walked away. Walked between the houses. Walked between the houses. Yet a review of, let's say, Investigator Serino's statement suggests that he told Investigator Serino that Trayvon Martin had run away. And that's a, a difference that you noticed? Right, and that's what, it said. what he had said on the dispatch was that he ran. Right, and I was going to say, we know from previous evidence that the dispatch non-emergency call suggests uh, that he ran away. And you're aware of that, aren't you? Yes. And that was a difference that you noted? Yes. Consider that to be significant? No. Why not? 
because I just assumed that he had come in and out of view at least twice, according to him. And whether or not he was running or walking, Did I don't think was significant, was mattered. Okay. Do you attach, when you look at different statements and determine whether or not the differences are significant, do you attach to those differences whether or not they help tell a narrative that might be beneficial to the witness or opposed to another witness? Is that part of what you look at? Yes, part of what we look at. Okay. So if running or walking isn't significant to the overall narrative, it doesn't seem to catch you as being a significant difference? It had been prior to the running and walking occurred prior to when we know on the 911 call he was had lost sight of him. So it wouldn't have changed anything. So that's why I didn't feel it was that important. Okay. When he said to you that he had walked through past the T because he wasn't sure the name of the street that he had just left, did that cause you any concern? I thought that as a neighborhood watch person, he would have known the names of the streets, yes. Okay. So what, tell me what, how you absorbed that or what you thought about that. I was wondering if he was wanting to get out of the car. Okay. And have you had a chance to go down by the scene to see whether or not there is street signs at that area? I know there's no street signs where he said that he parked. Were there any questions that you asked him or any changes in his story along the way that caused you concern? Not significantly, no. You've had those cases, haven't you? Where witnesses are telling you a story, you might question them a little bit, and then all of a sudden they remember a whole different fact? Yes. Okay. Um, any of that happen here? No. When he told you that Trayvon Martin got up or said something to him, like words like you got me or words to that effect, did that surprise you? No. And when he said that he had gotten on top of Trayvon Martin to spread his hands or to do something, and he had told another person to help him, did that cause you any concern? Is that part of the presentation by Mrs. Zimmerman? No. In the, in the written statement that Mrs. Zimmerman wrote out for you, uh, focus was on the fact that he called Trayvon Martin a suspect. Um, did he know Trayvon Martin's name at that time? No. Did you? No. Okay. So he had to be called something, would you agree? Yes. Did you consider to be suspect? such an outrageous term to use that it caused you concern? I didn't read it at the time. Does, how about today? No, I don't think it's unusual. Okay. Can I just have a moment, Your Honor? <clears throat> When um, Mr. Delayonda suggested to you that Mr. Zimmerman was claiming that this happened, he was claiming that, that happened, and that he claimed to be going through this, was that what he was saying to you when he was talking to you? 
I hereby claim that I was in fear. I hereby claim that I was walking down this no, roadway. No, he didn't, use, he he didn't was, say it that way. He was just talking to you as he was in the tape, right? Yes. And similarly, in the written statement, that was just him giving his story both verbally and in writing, wasn't it? Yes. You had stated that um, there were two things I think I wanted to focus you on. At one point, you had stated that Mrs. Zimmerman told you that he thought Trayvon Martin might have come from some bushes. Is yes. that correct? And then you also stated that you, he had said to you that he wasn't really exactly sure where he came from. That's Is that correct. correct. Yes. Do you consider that to be a significant concern or just him attempting to explain things for you. I didn't think that was significant because he said it was dark out there. You've seen some of the pictures out there that night, right? Yes. Would you agree if I use the term pitch black that it was pretty much pitch black out there? Yes. And you know that there are no, first of all, you know that there are bushes out there, correct? There's bushes, I believe, on the end of the buildings. I'm going to have just a moment. <coughs> And also, I believe there's bushes around some of the people who have air conditioners. They go around, I believe. There's bushes in those areas as well. I have a moment to have a couple of these marked, Your Honor. And I, there may not be an objection, so I'll just move them into evidence. There's no objection. I believe they're in. I think they're in. Um, for ease of use, I have them right here. Do you want to use them as a composite composite exhibit or individually? I think the clerk likes to have them individual, so I'll use individual if I might, Your Honor. Yes. So if there's no objection, one of them, I, I don't know which one you're handing to the clerk first, will come in as Defense Exhibit 21. The second one will come in as Defense Exhibit 22. Thank you, Your Honor. And may I approach the witness, Your Honor? Yes, you may. Officer Singleton, I'm going to show you um, pictures not of the way the scene was that night, but the next day, and ask if this is what you're familiar with. I'm going to show you both 22 and 21 because they're of a similar area. Is that what you're talking about? Yes, how there's bushes. I believe there's probably an air conditioner back here. And then this shows the end of the building. So if you would identify the number as you show it to the jury. There's if you likely would first, a the number. 144? It's, um, oh, HH. It's 22. Oh, this one, 22. Okay. Thank you. I believe there's probably an air conditioner back here. So there's some bushes there. And then this is the end of the building. And there's bushes along the wall. And if you would show the jury the similar um, locations on Exhibit 21. Here and here. And again, for also further down on in front of each, each unit, correct? Yes. Each unit has bushes around their air conditioners, from what I can tell from that Thank picture. You. Of course, none of those bushes have any, had any lights in them from your view of the nighttime photographs, do they? No, there's no lights in the bushes. Thank you. So it was not a concern of yours that Mr. Zimmerman first said he may have come out of bushes and then said not exactly sure where he came from. Right. Did that seem to be a, a, an event that, or a difference that could cause you any concern whatsoever? No, I was just looking at the bushes while we were out there trying to figure out this kid's pretty tall. Like what bushes, if he did come out of bushes, would he most likely be coming from? Okay. Would you agree with the pictures that we saw of that night that he could easily have simply just come out of the darkness? Sustained. <laughs> Nothing further than your honor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any redirect? Officer Singleton, would you agree that what's significant or what's not significant is up to the jury? Sure. Your just subjective state of mind, right? In terms of your, you have an opinion based on what he asked you. Mr. Yes, Roberts. he asked me for my opinion. Right? And when you agree with us, what's important is what the jury believes, correct? It's important what they believe, yes. Okay. Now, isn't it true, ma'am, when Mr. O'Mara kept asking you questions, that you had not been out to the scene at that time? I you was spoke to the defendant. I'd never gone to the scene that night. And isn't it also true that... Um, 
the defendant is telling you that he thought the person you now know, the 17-year-old boy, was alive, correct? I object, Your Honor, meeting. Sustained. The defendant told you, I believe you, you told Mr. O'Mara that he said he was surprised to learn that Trayvon Martin was alive. He didn't say that. When How did he react when you told him he was dead? He said he's dead. And that left you the yeah. impression that he thought he was that, alive? That was my impression that he, I thought he was alive. That I believed that he thought that he was alive. And Mr. Zimmerman, the defendant, in his statements to you, told you that he was scared of the defendant, of, of Mr. Zimmerman. I'm sorry, of Trayvon Martin. Let me object, Your Honor. That's a mischaracterization of the evidence in the testimony today. So I would I'm glad to rephrase it. Okay, thank you. In his statements to you, Mr. Zierman told you that he claims that the defendant was, he was being bashed, his head was being bashed into the concrete, correct? Slammed into the concrete. Slammed. And he had to shoot the person you now know as Trayvon Martin, correct? That's what he said he did. That's what he said he did. You weren't there. I wasn't there. You don't know whether that's true or not. No, I don't know whether that's okay. true or not. But he told you, at some point you told him that the victim was actually dead, correct? Yes. And how did he react? Shocked. Okay. Do you know why, if Mr. Zimmerman, the defendant, claimed or didn't realize that the victim was dead, why he would holster his gun back if he was so scared of Trayvon Martin? If he was still alive, why he would holster his gun back? Objection, Your Honor. Speculation. Sustained as a speculation. Do you know why Mr. Zimmerman told you he pushed, he holstered his gun back? Did he elaborate on that? Objection. I'm sorry. I think that was a factual question. I apologize. Did Mr. Zimmerman elaborate as to why he would holster his gun back if he thought the victim was alive? He didn't put those two terms together. That wasn't significant to you? I don't know if that's significant. Well, tell me, how many times have you gone out to a scene where you were trying to apprehend a suspect, right, a person that yes. you believe is in committing a crime, and you don't believe the person is, is a, or you think the person is a threat at you, do you holster your gun if the person is still at large or moving around? No. What do you do? I wait till it's safe. Right? You keep the gun on the person until you make sure he's either dead or he's apprehended, correct? Yes. By the way, did you use the word suspect or did he, Mr. Zierman, use the word suspect? I didn't use the word suspect to him. Perfect. And so when Mr. O'Mara asked you about the word suspect not being significant, that is because you're used to using the word suspect when you're apprehending or, or describing somebody who you feel or you suspect is committing a crime, correct? Yes, that's what I use. Do you know why Mr. Zimmerman switched from using the word they to suspect when he referred to the victim? You would agree that that would be pure speculation, right? Yes. You get Her answer would be speculation, or I'm sorry, I object it, it, on <coughs> speculation. The changing of the terms would be speculate for her to be yes, speculation. Sir. You agree that that would be you speculating, correct? Yes. Just like all the questions that Mr. O'Mara asked you about significance and all that, that would be you speculating, correct? Which question? All the questions he asked you about the, whether you knew that uh, Mr. O'Mara, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Zimmerman, the defendant, had ill will, hatred, or angry at Trayvon Martin. You don't, were you, you, you weren't able to get into Mr. Zimmerman's mind at the time he got, did the shooting, were you? No. You weren't able to get into his mind as to why he followed this person, were you? Only what he told me. So you didn't know what was in his heart or in his mind at the time that he sought out, or to use his words, followed the 17-year-old unarmed boy? I only knew what he told me. You were also asked about the um, whether there was an eyewitness or not there, you hadn't interviewed anybody up to the point you interviewed a defendant, had you? No, I didn't speak to anybody prior to speaking with 
怎么？Mr. Romero asked you about the screaming. Remember, Mr. Romero asking you questions about recording about screaming? Yes. Okay. Mr. Zerman, the defendant told you he, that he saw people out there, correct? <clears throat> yes. So he had to have known that if somebody was screaming, whether it was him or somebody else, somebody would have heard it. Someone potentially heard it because they came out and they said he's seen them. Right. Or he said he's seen at least one person. Right. He's, he, the defendant, is just claiming that it was him. You can't say whether it was him or not, can you? That's, I'm sorry, I don't understand. You can't question. say that it was Mr. Zierman, the defendant, who was screaming for help. I can't say that, no. Thank you, ma'am. Just so we're clear, I had to uh, talk about whether or not Mr. Zimmerman had ill will, hatred, spite, and the other ones that are necessary for self for second degree murder. I wasn't asking you to speculate. I want to be very clear. What I asked you for was whether or not you had any evidence. We, you know what evidence, of course, is. Right? So, did you have any evidence to support a contention that Mr. Zimmerman acted in your presence in such a way that you thought he had ill will? And that's what I thought you asked me, and that's I what I was, was answering. And and it no, he didn't evidence any of that. Yeah, no spite, no hatred, no animosity, did he? If he had it, he didn't show it. So the only evidence you would be able to present on that issue, not your speculation, but just the evidence, would be that you didn't see any. I didn't see him <laughs> act out anything. And I think you said that if you were in a shooting situation, right, even if, even where you just have to draw your service revolver, um, you would not reholster it until you were safe. Is that accurate? I would reholster it once I believed the threat was no longer. Right. Like maybe when another officer came up with a flashlight, yes. that you knew you had backup, at that point would you feel more comfortable putting it away? Absolutely. Okay. When a, another witness came up and when you realized that the person who you just had to shoot um, was staying face down, would that give you good cause to believe it was now safe to reholster your weapon? Yes. Okay. Nothing further. Thank you. Any of you The ill will hatred. What you're saying is that at the time you were interviewing, he was not showing ill will or hatred, correct? Right. Okay. Because he, Mr. Zerman, wouldn't you agree, was trying to convince you that he hadn't done anything wrong, right? I asked him to tell me what happened, and he, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Singleton, the officer. Singleton, the excuse. Um, yes, Your Honor. Can we approach your mom before we make that decision? Yes. Thank you. Officer Singleton, you're excused from the courtroom, but you're still on recall um, under subpoena. Thank you very much. The state police call their next witness. May we call investigator officer Chris Serino.
solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God. Yes, I do. Thank you. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, sir. Could you state your name for the record, please? Good afternoon, sir. Christopher F. Serino. What is your occupation? I'm a Sanford police officer. How long have you been a member of the Sanford Police Department? Going on 16 years. And prior to that, did you have some law enforcement experience, sir? Yes, sir, I did. Could you briefly tell us about that? With the Department of Defense out of Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, as a uniformed federal police officer. How long were you so employed? Uh, two years. What are your current duties with the Sanford Police Department? A patrol officer. Okay. And how long have you been a patrol officer this time? I know you've gone back and forth. I believe since July or August of last year. Okay. Back in February of 2012, were you assigned to the investigative division or major crime section unit? Yes, sir, I was. And how many tours have you done in that unit and then also back to patrol? Is that a normal thing or tell us about that briefly? It's a lateral transfer position. This is my third tour back there. I want to draw your attention to February 26 of 2012. Were you the on-call investigator and did you respond to the retreat at Twin Lakes? Yes, sir, I was. Approximately what time do you believe you got there? I believe I got there at approximately 8 p.m. And when you arrived there, were there officers already present? Yes, sir, there were. Okay. Was the body of the person later identified to you as Trayvon Benjamin Martin still at the scene, sir? Yes, he was. And was the person who shot uh, Trayvon Martin, that is George Zimmerman, still at the scene when you arrived? No, he was not. And did you remain at the scene and later go to the Sanford Police Department? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, at the scene, did you speak to officers there? Yes, sir, I did. And did you also meet with witnesses? Yes, sir, I did. When you first arrived, uh, had the body of um, the victim, Trayvon Martin, been identified at that point? No, sir, he had not. Okay. And at that time, uh, you didn't know who he was or whether he even lived in, in, in that area, is that correct? No, sir, we didn't know. Were attempts made to identify him at the scene, sir? Yes, there were. And can you briefly tell us how that was done, sir? Um, by facial recognition of officers that were there, by canvassing the area for potential um, people that may have known who he was. Um, we ultimately were able to obtain a, uh, a device, it's called the live scan device, and um, we checked his fingerprints to see if they were on file in our database, and uh, we had no, no results. So everything was negative in terms of being able to identify the person you now know as Trayvon Benjamin Martin? Yes, sir. All attempts were negative. And later, in fact, did you further check at the Sanford Police Department and his name did not appear in your all's records, is that correct? Yes, sir, I did. Now, later that evening, did you end up going to the Sanford Police Department? Yes, I did. Okay. And do you recall exactly what time you got there? It was around midnight. Okay. When you came in, into um, the Sanford Police Department, did you end up having contact with the person now known to you as George Zimmerman? Yes, I did. Could you please identify him by stating where he is seated in an article of clothing that he wears? At the defense table, Mr. Priestley. Your Honor, the record reflect the witness has identified the defendant. The record will so reflect. When you came into contact with the defendant, George Zierman, were you aware that he already had been interviewed by investigator um, Doris Singleton? Yes, sir. Okay. And um, did you have a very brief interview with him right after midnight around 12.05 or so a.m.? Yes, I did. Okay. And before I play that, was that interview recorded in terms of a uh, audio recording? Yes, sir, it was. For purpose of the record, Your Honor, I believe we need to introduce that into evidence as the next exhibit. Uh, it's going to be number uh, 179. It's previously been shown to defense counsel, and they have no objection. 
That's correct, Your Honor. Okay, come and say this. Um, states Exhibit 179. <coughs> So I 
I don't remember if I pushed him or he fell, but somehow I got out from under him. Mm -hmm. And when he was hitting me, I don't know what he was hitting me with. I thought he had something in his hands. Mm -hmm. So I grabbed his hands when I was on top of him and I spread his hands away from his body mm -hmm. because he was still talking. And I was on top of him. And that's when somebody came and they had a flashlight too. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was a police officer, so I got off of him. What was he saying when he was talking to you? I don't know. After you got me, I don't remember. If you, you're going to have anxiety over this and nightmares and everything else, so you're probably going to have a hard time with this whole thing. I'm here for that. Um, that's all I can give you between now until tomorrow. I can get you other kinds of help afterwards, okay? But you got to go and get some rest. Is there anything else you want to add? So in your mind's eye, this person was committing no good over there. You have followed in good faith to go ahead and see what he was doing. He jumped you. He attacked you. Okay. He reached for your gun. You discharged. You got off of him. You only shot once. Police arrived. You surrendered. And here you are. He told me he was going to kill me. Exactly. He said he was going to kill you. Okay. Anything else you want to add? You've already admitted you once where you probably done. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and put this in. It's now 1210. Investigator Sereno, may I approach the witness, Sean? Yes, Investigator Sereno, um, you mentioned in the interview with the defendant that you showed him a photograph of this defendant photograph you were to show him? I believe so, sir. Right, if I may publish that to the jury. Yes, Defendant told you he didn't know the person, correct? That's correct, sir. When you spoke to him, I want to show you some photographs. I probably need Miss Waldrop's help. You see that in front of you, stage exhibit uh, 64? Yes, sir. Okay. And is this the condition that uh, you observed the defendant, Mr. Zimmerman, when you spoke to him, sir? Yes, it is. Okay. Thank you, Ron. I don't think I need to lie to you anymore. My question is, did um, when you spoke to him, did you have any problems understanding him when he spoke to you? No, sir, I did not. Did he have any problems understanding you, sir? No, sir. Did you threaten him in any way in order to get him to make any statements, sir? No, sir, I did not. Did you make him any promise in order to get him to make his statements? No. Your observ observations of the defendant that uh, evening, did you consider those injuries to be minor, major, or what? Minor. You mentioned you made arrangements and, and that recording is reflected to meet with him later the next, I guess it technically would have been the morning of the 27th, later that evening, is that correct? Yes, sir. Now, later that morning, before you made contact with the defendant, did you become aware of a missing person report that turned out to be Trayvon Martin? Yes, sir, I did. And did you respond back to the scene and go to 2631 Retreat View Circle 
where Brandy Green lived and where Trayvon Martin was staying that weekend? Yes, I did. Okay. Your Honor, may I approach the witness again? Yes, you may. You have the chart by there's two of them. Investigator Serino, I'll show you the state exhibit 140. When you came into contact with Brandy Green, and I believe also Tracy Martin, would that have been at 2631? Yes, sir. And is that when you understood Mr. Martin, Trayvon Martin was staying um, 